Hello. All right, everyone. Hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. On behalf of the Online Events Committee and the Young Scholars Committee, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the second Feminist Economics 101 event of this season. My name is Musna Alvi, and I'm a research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, and I'm based at the South Asia office, which is in New Delhi. Today, I am beyond excited to be hosting Professor Jayati Ghosh to discuss new frontiers in development, international trade, and labor economics, all from a feminist lens. We are hoping that today's event brings together reflections from Jaiti's rich career in economics and provides a roadmap uh, for future aspiring young feminist economic scholars. Before I introduce Jayati, let me tell you a bit about the series and the logistics for today. So some house rules. Uh, today's event is part of the new online event series on Feminist Economics 101. Uh, and the series is a continuation of the series that were featured in the 2021 pre-conference by the Young Scholars Committee. IAFI has greatly expanded its membership of young scholars in recent years, which is very exciting. And we hope that this new season will create an important avenue to explore core concepts concepts and issues and frameworks within feminist economics. Um, and we also want to highlight the methodological differences from mainstream economics to conversations with experts in each field. So each event will feature interviews of senior scholars by young or early career scholars. Uh, and I'm really at the border of what yeah, young and early career. Uh, we also hope that these conversations will inform and empower young scholars in their work as they begin or continue their, their journey into economics. If you're interested in previous interviews, you can check them out on the IAFI website and our YouTube channel. And I also strongly recommend that you stay tuned to IAFI social media and websites for additional events. Uh, we have many other events, not just this. We have the Feminist Economics of Global Reproductive Justice event series and also several fireside chats that you can join. So a bit about today's event. The event uh, is a one hour and we record it and post it on YouTube. So if you do have to leave in between, don't worry, you can catch the entire conversation later. Uh, for the next 30 or so minutes, I will pose questions to Professor Jethi on her expertise in international and labor economics and how it relates to feminist economics, followed by a conversation on feminist economics in general. Uh, but we also aim to provide an interactive dialogue with Jethi by including Q&A uh, session after the interview. So while you're listening in, feel free to put in your questions in the chat or when we open for questions, you can use the raise hand function, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, Yasky will help me moderate those questions that are coming in through the chat. And lastly, this is a Zoom call, not a webinar. Uh, so a kind reminder to please keep yourself muted throughout the event unless you're asking a question at the Q&A section. So with no further delay, it is my absolute honor to introduce today's senior scholar and my I'm Phil advisor and my dear teacher, Jayati Ghosh. Uh, Jayati taught economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi for nearly 35 years. And since January of 2021, she has been a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She has authored and edited more than 20 books and more than 200 scholarly articles. And some of her recent books include uh, The Making of a Catastrophe, COVID-19 and the Indian Economy, Women Workers in the Informal Economy, Women's Work in Globalizing India, among many others. She's been widely recognized for her work and has been awarded several prizes, including the ILO's Decent Work uh, Research Prize in 2015. She has advised governments in India and other countries, including as a chairperson of the Andhra Pradesh Commission on Farmers' Welfare and a member of the National Knowledge Commission of India from 2005 to 2009. She uh, was the executive secretary of the International Development Economics Association, which is an international network of heterodox development economists uh, for nearly 20 years from 2002 to 2021. Uh, in, uh, in 2021, she was appointed to the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. And in March of last year, uh, she was appointed the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. And we're going to touch on some of those uh, questions today. Um, and the, the mandate of this High Level Advisory Board is to provide a vision for international cooperation to deal with current and future challenges. She also writes regularly for popular media, including newspapers, journals, and blogs. And she's a social media star. And so I think most of you already follow her on Twitter. But if you don't, you should absolutely go and do that right away. So before much ado, uh, let me start by welcoming Jaipi. Thank you so much for taking our time to, to chat with us and to share your knowledge. Uh, and I want to sort of quickly get in. Uh, the idea for the next 30 or so minutes is to uh, talk about you know, your work and your career, and I've framed a couple of questions that I'm hoping can guide our, our mm. conversation. Uh, 
So just to start off, you know, it, I was wondering if you could reflect on your journey through economics. Uh, as the discipline has evolved over the last few decades, how has your own thinking on economics evolved over your career? Well, thank you, Muzna. And let me also first express how happy I am to be here, especially to be interviewed by you. And as part of this Young Scholars uh, involvement in IAP, I have to tell you that the Young Scholars are the best thing that has happened to IAP in a very long time. You are all so energetic, you're so committed, and you have so many new and fresh ideas that it has really livened up the whole organization. It's, it's made all of us feel young. So, you know, thank you all for doing this. I think it's terrific. And I'm, I'm really happy to be able to be part of this with you. So having said that, you know, it's really weird, my relationship with economics, because I actually started studying sociology. And I studied sociology because I was interested in society and social processes and change and, and all of that. But I, during my undergraduate degree, as you know, we have these undergraduate honors degrees. So my honors was in sociology. And I kept thinking, I kept feeling that actually this is skimming the surface, that you know the real stuff is happening in the economy and the society is expressing that. So I actually switched to economics for my graduate degree and I continued doing economics then for the rest of my time. And I was lucky because I joined JNU at a time when there were some really amazing professors, you know, Krishna Bharadwaj and uh, Amit Bhaduri, Prabhat Patnaik, Utta Patnaik, Sunanda Sen, Sheila Bhalla. They were really all amazing scholars in their own right who made economics seem incredibly relevant, topical, necessary, important. But I have to say, now over many decades of doing the subject, I've kind of come full circle. I've realized that you cannot understand the economy without understanding society. And so a lot of economists have failed in that, you know, and a lot of economics as a discipline has failed in that. So in a way, I'm kind of going uh, against the idea that you have to be within that discipline. I think to 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 do that discipline properly, to understand the economy properly, you really need to bring in many, many more different uh, perspectives and disciplinary insights. Thanks, JP. I think I, I agree with a lot of what you've said. You know, I, in my work now, I, I have the sort of incredible fortune of working with economists, but also, you know, hydrologists and sociologists mm -hmm. and pe people in nutrition and health. Uh, and it's, it's enriched my own understanding of what it means to be an economist, how to study things that are interesting to me from multiple perspectives. I think uh, when you're just looking at it from a narrow economics lens, especially for those of us who've come from a traditional economics straight, you know, sort of quote unquote traditional quantitative economics training, I think we we kind of get a bit blinded to, you know, how we, we ask the question of how much, but not enough of how, of why uh, and how. Uh, so I think that's that's been really uh Great, I think I agree with you know everything that you've said. Um, you 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 ha you're a you're a macroeconomist and you know a, a macroeconomist who who studies trade, who studies international economics. What role do you see for feminist thinking in macroeconomics and trade? Uh, especially, this is also an area where you know female economists are are vastly underrepresented uh, among other sort of subdisciplines of economics. Um, and, and then maybe reflecting on you know what are some of the major macroeconomic policies that have worked. Uh, we often hear about things that have not worked, but you know, especially thinking of it from a feminist economics lens, like what's what's worked? Wow, okay, many questions in that one. So, mm. you know, I would say that actually I think I think feminist a, a feminist perspective, and I want to emphasize, you know, the okay, let me begin by saying that there is a problem often when people say, okay, let's have a lecture on feminist economics as a separate thing from looking at all the other areas of study. Whereas I really think that what we have to have is a sort of gendered perspective on everything, which includes micro and macro. I mean, I think, for example, the philosophical underpinnings of microeconomics are completely undermined when you recognize gender. I mean, you know, let's face, face it, utilitarianism, possessive individualism, the idea that utility maximization, which is the choice between work, which gives you income and leisure, are the ways in which individuals respond and and that's completely destroyed when you mention the care economy. I mean, unpaid care work should not exist in that framework. And yet it, it is the huge underpinning of society and the economy. So I think micro definitely 
changes when you recognize these, these insights. But in the macroeconomy, you know, there are so many things that we don't understand, that we leave out, and that we're even unable to explain if we are thinking of it in terms of rational economic man aggregated into, you know, sort of big uh, aggregates of consumption, investment, savings, and so on. So it's in every possible way, it's how do households save? What is the, the gender dynamics that is enabling households to save or to consume particular things at all? But it is also in terms of how these play out over time. I mean, uh, let me give you one example from, from the international sphere, which uh, is very telling because it shows you how even the people who are working on this don't recognize it. So, you know, remittances is an increasingly important part of global flows, right? In many countries, they account for more than all forms of capital flow put together. This was true for India for most of the 90s and large part of the 2000s. But it's true for Sri Lanka, it's true for Pakistan, it's true for Bangladesh, it's true for Mexico. I mean, a bunch of countries where remittances are hugely important. The World Bank brings out a report on remittances every year. In 2010, their report was extremely surprised that after the global financial crisis, there are some countries that didn't show a decline. Okay, many countries showed a decline, obviously, right? There was a big global financial crisis, migrant workers across the world either lost their jobs or lost wages. And, you know, so remittances would come down, expected. And they say along the expected lines, most of these countries show a decline. But there are some countries that don't show a decline. And the big ones that didn't show a decline were Sri Lanka, Philippines, and India. And they said, this is a puzzle. We cannot understand this. These are people who've been working for on remittances all their lives, okay? They said, this is impossible to explain or understand. And I thought, wow, it just tells you. Because, you know, the big difference about Sri Lanka and, and Philippines is that these are dominantly women migrants. In the Philippines, women outnumber men 13 to one. For every male migrant, there are 13 women out migrants, the Balik Bayan as they're known, okay? In Sri Lanka, it's eight to one. Now, so these women migrants in Sri Lanka and the Philippines, they are dominantly in the care sector. They are nurses or domestic workers, maybe 18, 90% of them, some of them in hospitality and other stuff. But the thing about women migrants in the care sector is that, you know, actually their employment is relatively impervious to the business cycle in the developed world, in the destination countries. So men migrants are mostly in construction, manufacturing, which are very business cycle driven. Yeah, when a downturn, construction and manufacturing are the first to get laid off or to lose, you know, employment and, and wages. Whereas the care sector is a bit less uh, it's in that sense more resilient, you know, at least over the immediate business cycle. So they are less likely to actually lose their jobs and they are more likely to send money back home because they know that things are bad back home. So you find that countries with dominantly women migrants, say Sri Lanka, compare, and I've compared the remittances of Sri Lanka with Pakistan, and you see very, very clearly, Pakistani remittances completely dependent on the business cycle of the destination countries. Sri Lankan remittances, no, they are quite impervious. And if you similarly compare, let us say the Philippines with say Mexico or some other country with very male migrants, you get that same picture. Yet all these people who've been studying migration forever and these big fat global reports don't recognize this basic fact. And so they, they, they're unable to understand what should be glaringly obvious, you know? Of course it affects policy as well in, in all kinds of ways that you know, I'm sure everybody in this audience will recognize, but it's just one example of the many ways in which not looking at the gender dimension is, uh, you know, is a critical part of it. I mean, the most obvious form of it is austerity, right? Fiscal austerity, which is imposed on economies, and then they say, okay, you have to take this pain and so on. Wait a minute, who's taking the pain? Who's actually cushioning the economy and the society in this period when you're cutting down on basic social spending and provision of essential social services, it is women and girls doing the unpaid labor in these households who actually take up that slack. So, you know, a lot of the fiscal austerity package, it's not just that they impact women differently or that they have a worse effect on them. Of course, it's true, but it's also that they rely on this unpaid labor. In other words, 
forget the outcome. It is in fact something that is dependent on the existence of unpaid labor, which is why I think we make a mistake when we say these are gender blind policies because they're not gender blind. They are fully gender aware. They are gender exploitative. They're using the fact that you know that all of this stuff will get done anyway, even when governments and public policies don't provide it. And so society will survive. It will survive on the backs of all of this increased unpaid labor. So, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a critical way, the, the fact that we've ignored all of this in our macroeconomic thinking has enabled macroeconomic policies to be exploit that difference and get away with a lot more. <laughs> Thanks, Jayati. It's interesting that you mentioned remittances because just earlier today I was having a conversation with a colleague. We are analyzing some data about you mm -hmm. know female migrant workers from Bangladesh to uh, to West Asia, um, and and we were sort of struck by the fact that almost all of the women who said they had returned due to COVID said they wanted to go back. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, as we sort of digging in, start digging into the data a little bit and also spoke to our colleagues who are based in, in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said that, you know, and what you said about, you know, being a care worker, they said a lot of women, first of all, could not go because their passports are with their employers. And so they, mm -hmm. even if they wanted to go, they could not go. But a lot of these women are contributing almost entirely to their household expenses. Like there is no one back home who can support the household. So the moment they come back, regardless of whether they've had uh, a negative migration experience, an exploitative migration experience, they're all keen to go back. I mean, because no jobs at home yeah. uh, and, you know, a, a guarantee of, of at least some kind of, of, of income yeah. that can be yeah. sent back home. So um, yeah, this really touches close to home and, and, and to the work that yeah. we're doing. Um, another thing you touched upon, I, I guess, well, some people argue that that gender research in economics is different from feminist research. So what differences do you see? Because there is now a lot of work that is happening on, you know, looking at differences between men and women and how they respond at both at the macroeconomics level, at, at you know, uh, at the microeconomics level on, you know, you could look at behavioral outcomes, you can look at spending, et cetera. Uh, but, but is gender economics different or gender research in economics different from a feminist perspective in economics research? Uh, and, and what differences do you see, especially in the context of development and labor? So yeah, I know there's a lot of behavioral economic stuff on you know different responses by gender and so on. Uh, I, I mean, I, okay, uh, let me admit that I'm not a huge fan of those, especially the experimental stuff because you know I really don't. I mean, human behavior is so complex. I will behave differently depending on the time of day. Forget you know on whether or not I've had a fight with someone just before or you know, somebody else has been very nice to me. So it, it's so dependent on context, on your social position, which is, includes gender, of course, but it also includes a whole range of other things. As we all know, we are, we are multiple identities. So I'm, I'm a little wary of, you know, the, the, the experimental behavioral stuff that suggests that you can identify how people behave in a certain context and then generalize it to wider, more general contexts. Um, having said that, do I think there's a difference between gender e economics of gender and feminist economics? Well, let me put it this way. The minute you say feminist economics, it's seen as a threat, okay? Whereas people will allow gender economics, the economics of gender. In fact, there are places in uh, universities in India which will now allow a course on the economics of gender but not allow a course on feminist economics. And to me, that says something. I, it suggests that maybe we're doing something right if we're saying feminist economics, because what are we threatening? We are threatening the very basis, the foundations of what passes for economic knowledge. That's a good thing. I think it needs to be threatened. I think it, it has a lot of flaws and those flaws have to be picked on and that's how we can make this subject better. So I personally would, would actually opt for sticking with saying that I'm a feminist economist and that I, a lot of what I'm doing is feminist economics because it is taking a different perspective, which doesn't mean necessarily always classifying by gender. You know, it's not always about saying, okay, this is how it affects men, this is how it affects women, or this is the labor market participation of men. This is, it's much deeper. It's actually saying, 
you're going to be looking at this from a lens that recognizes some critical things. And most of all, I would say it recognizes unpaid labor and social reproduction. Because to me, that's at the heart of this issue. And a whole lot of how we organize our economies and societies is about ensuring that that unpaid labor keeps happening. I mean, that's what patriarchy is all about, finally. So recognizing that and bringing that to the forefront does something that just, a, you know, a, a, a straight, shall we say, economics of gender doesn't necessarily do. And of course, once you do the unpaid labor, then that impacts on labor markets. And so you get segmented labor markets, which are segmented by gender, but also by other social categories. And um, certainly by, you know, by caste in India, we know by religion, by race, by ethnicity, by language, by location, many ways to segment labor markets. Gender, of course, being a very cross-cutting one. But here I also want to recognize that for me, a, a good feminist economics also recognizes the other forms of segmentation, which can include, for example, you know, sexual orientation or um, uh, transgender and, and you know, other kinds of ways of discrimination and exclusion. So I guess for me, feminist economics is, is a bit like you know, what I would have earlier call myself a socialist, right? I still do. But I'm saying for me, you know, the economics of socialism is not about a very simplistic notion of equality. It's much more about recognizing beyond just distributive inequality. It's about recognizing relational inequality, which is all about power imbalances, the ability of, a, of an individual or a group to control the actions of another individual or group. And so for me, being a feminist is recognizing all of that. So that's why I would like to hold on to the, the feminist economics tag. I, I think that's important. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned about, you know, looking at, for example, in the Indian context, caste and religion, and, and one talks about intersectionality, but I think one can in some ways criticize even the, within feminist economics and feminist movements, the uh, that the voices of minority women have have you know not been mm -hmm. recognized and heard and so it's it's, yeah. it's great yeah. that we are having this conversation about you know yeah. how do we expand yeah. not just thinking about feminist economics and looking at even women from marginalized groups within within the ambit of, of economics yeah. I think that's that's really critical mm -hmm. um, uh, so Jaiti you've worked extensively with international and multilateral organizations are there any success stories globally that you can highlight where this critical feminist economics thinking and really let's not just think about gender again you know let's talk about broadly yeah. where where this critical feminist economics thinking has been mainstreamed and has been integrated into policy and practice uh, and are there any sort of long-term results that that you can kind of highlight <laughs> wow i wish i wish i mean look i think at least among international organizations yes there's been progress you know there's been more change has it permeated to national levels? Again, you know, so mm. much depends on domestic politics, political economy, the strength mm. of particular movements, the kind of pushback you get, all of that. What success? Okay, there's one thing I am, yeah, I'm, I, won't, I won't say the battle is won, but I'm, I'm kind of proud that we, we shifted the discussion a little bit, okay? And so this mm. is related to um, another group that I'm a, a member of, but there's a UN, a high level advisory board on economic and social affairs, which is headed by the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. And this has a, a bunch of very impressive economists on it. Um, uh, you know, Joe Stiglitz, Jose Antonio Campo, a lot a, a very, very impressive, uh, Jeff Sachs, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of very impressive men, but it also has a bunch of noisy women. So Mariana Matsukato is on it, I'm on it, and you know there are uh, others who are um, capable of making a noise. Now, one of the things that we were asked to look at was you know, the usefulness of GDP as an indicator. And so some of us actually wrote uh, quite strongly about how it is not a good indicator of human progress. And we put in a, a, a bunch of reasons why, which we were very happy to see that the Secretary General actually took up. And, in, in our common agenda, one of the aspects that he has highlighted is the need to look beyond GDP and to have a set of indicators that would actually provide a better idea of what um, could, that, you know, that what the United Nations itself should be tracking in terms of progress. So you can imagine, already you have this 
the sustainable development goals, right? 17 goals, 172 targets, everybody's going mad doing all that measurement. So they said, you know, for God's sake, are you just going to such, just suggest another dashboard with a zillion indicators? So we actually then, um, some of us uh, have suggested, in fact, I had suggested five indicators. Uh, uh, I've actually suggested four indicators. We now have five indicators, which have been proposed by this group and which have come out with, um, with some degree of, shall we say, sanction from the UN. So what we have suggested is that in addition to GDP, which is not gonna go away just because we say it's a terrible indicator, it's still going to be used all the time. But in addition to GDP, we have suggested that every country track and the UN monitors on a regular basis, firstly, a labor market indicator, which is what? The employment rate multiplied by the median wage. Okay, so why is that useful? Because the employment rate is not the unemployment rate. It's how many workers, how many paid workers in the working age population. That's good because it also tells you how many unpaid workers. In other words, the lower the employment rate, the more likely you have more and more unpaid workers, in addition to the openly unemployed. And the median wage is a much better indicator than the average wage, because fully half of your workers are earning less than that. And in fact, for the countries in which we did provide some estimates, you can see that in fact, often it works, it goes in a completely different direction from per capita GDP. This labor market indicator can be flat as it is in the US, for example, when per capita GDP is rising. So that's the first. The second we said was time use data. Now 80 countries are already providing time use surveys, we said, just expand this, you know, fund governments to do time use surveys and collect it regularly, annually. And time use data for paid work, unpaid work, and personal and relational time, just these three categories. So once you do that, that's huge, right? First of all, the gender gaps in time use, but also tracking how much more time use goes into unpaid work will be a really good indicator for the overall status and condition of women over time. So that's the second indicator. The third indicator is um, the access to food, which is something IFPRI is very good at. So we are basically saying the proportion of the population that can afford the FAO's um, you know, nutritious diet, which as you know, in India is appalling, right? It's only about, I think as many as 71% cannot afford it in India. But you know, basically tracking that indicator across all countries and across time. Um, per capita food consumption is an additional one that food grain consumption, which I had not suggested, but was suggested by others. And uh, this one has been adopted essentially to be tracking the broader food grain requirement, which covers everything. You know, if you eat more beef, that's a total food grain requirement. That's quite a lot. Yeah, so it's really a more, you know, in terms of sustainability, a kind of argument. And finally, of course, per capita carbon emissions. So I had said that for the per capita carbon emissions, we should look also at the distribution. So we should look at per carbon emissions in consumption terms. The OECD collects data for about 85 countries on per capita carbon emission by total final demand, not just production. But also let's look at it in terms of the inequality. And the World Inequality Lab is now producing some really interesting data on the top 10% carbon emissions relative to the bottom 50%. So I suggested, let's look at the average, that's the per capita, multiplied by the top 10 by 50. So we get a sense of the inequality in that. Yeah. The, great, the good news for me is that this is something that has actually been, well, I mean, it's gone to the next level, shall we say. It's going to be considered by ECOSOC. And then from ECOSOC, it goes to the General Assembly. So there's a long way to go still, but at least it's out there. At least, you know, these are now being seriously considered by the global, by the UN system. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, that's great to hear, Jaiti. And, and you touched upon, you know, about carbon. And, and I think uh, there's no conversation about feminist economics where we cannot consider climate change and climate shocks. You've written extensively about you know, COVID-19 management or rather mismanagement globally. Uh, and our own research at IFRI, for example, has shown persistent impacts on women from the lockdowns and the subsequent fuel and food price crisis following the Russia-Ukraine conflict. 
Um, and conflicts, shocks, and weather extremes are going to become more common in the lifetime of most young scholars who are listening in. Uh, what are some tools that feminist economics, feminist thinking gives us so that our response to crisis, especially when we're looking at impacts on women, is proactive rather than reactive? Yeah, this is such a good question, you know, because the thing is, it feeds into all of the things, all of the concerns that we have, you know, the unequal distribution of assets, the uh, distribution of labor time and the, the, uh, the sort of social assumption that the provisioning for the household is the responsibility of women so that, you know, they'll have to go out there and collect the water and the firewood and, the, and all of the other stuff that happens when, when bad things happen around you in terms of nature and climate shocks and so on. So yeah, this is a huge question. And I think the problem is often that, you know, the response to crises and shocks has been seen in terms of social protection. It's been, okay, are you providing enough income for the family? Do you provide, you know, basic needs when, it, when they are disrupted for any reason? We are less looking, I believe, at the, um, the more essential kinds of things that would ensure not just resilience, because we know there will be resilience. It'll be resilience on the backs of all of these, you know, and all this unpaid labor and lower consumption of women and girls. That's what resilience means. So I think we should be focusing not so much on resilience, because the resilience is forced on households, but on ensuring that what we would earlier consider are the basic needs and the basic rights the social and economic rights are protected specifically for women and girls. What we do find is that shocks of all kinds hit them first in all possible ways. And then that, as you say, has a persistent impact. You know, it stays forever and ever. So the first thing should be, what can we do to make sure that those shocks don't hit them first? What are the strategies which will vary, right? According to what the, what the crisis is, what the context is. But why should it be that the women disproportionately lose the jobs? Why should it be that the women are the ones responsible for doing all the unpaid work to make sure that people have you know, the fuel required for cooking food or access to clean water or whatever? So I think we have to begin with those. How do we ensure that the shocks do not disrupt um, and, and damage the minimal social and economic rights of women and girls? first, in a way. Uh, you're muted, sorry. I think. No, yes, no. sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of sort of our structured Q&A. Uh, now I'm hoping to have sort of a more free-flowing conversation about feminist economics, about young scholars. Um, I so can I ask questions. you? So can I? Yes. Can I ask you some questions? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, yes. So you know, Musa, I I have to say I have really been delighted by the young women I come across in classes. Okay, because I think you're all much, you know, you're all quite spunky, and um, and you become spunky over time, right? You sort of enter university not a shyer, maybe quieter, and then you come out much more vocal and articulate. So I want to ask you a couple of things. I want to ask you, first of all, what, when was it or what was it that made you think that feminist economics is an important thing? What made you attracted to that idea at all? Was it something specific or? Um, so I, I, as you know, I mean, you know, had a very traditional sort of undergrad economics training, uh, which was very pretty standard sort of doing micro macro econometrics type of, of classes. Um, I think internally I was kind of, I'm, 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 I come from a minority community, I'm a woman, uh, you know, sort of all of these multiple conflicting identities that somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that, 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 you know, I needed to reckon with in some ways. Uh, and I, I don't think it was until my when I was in my master's degree where I got to study in a campus that was much more heterogeneous, I should, if I should say, uh, along multiple dimensions. You know, I got to interact with people who had come from various disadvantaged caste groups, which I was something that I was completely blinded to during my undergrad. I don't know if it was just sort of the kind of institution I went to, or maybe I was just not aware. Um, and, and so, you know, having those conversations with, with classmates and friends who similarly came from, you know, I mean, I, 
I was not from an economically disadvantaged group, but, you know, having faced these sort of microaggressions, just generally sort of thinking that that I don't think the economic training I had got till then equipped me to answer these kind of questions. And so during my master's, when I seriously started thinking about it, and then during my MPhil, which I did under you, was when I kind of started thinking, I was really interested in looking at, you know, Muslim women, for example, and why are the outcomes so different from even, say, Dalit women who are look quite similar to Muslim women on almost all sort of observable indicators, what it is that is driving, uh, you know, these disparate uh, experiences of, of Muslim and Dalit women within the Indian economy. So I think that was, was uh, you know, my, my training and my master's. And I also did a master's in development studies. So it was not pure economics. I was studying sociology. I was studying urban development and, you know, looking at it from multiple angles, which forced me to sort of unpack some of the things that I had learned and sort of relearn how to look at economics, similarly to the ways that you did. I think you went from sociology to economics, I went from economics to studying development studies. So for me, that was really my first kind of foray into thinking about, about feminist economics and, and need, needing to bring a feminist lens into economics. You know, the other thing I often wonder, because uh, we, uh, my generation, I'm pretty old, right? I'm going to be 68 later this year. So mm -hmm. in my generation, we were, uh, relatively few, you know, so often we were, it, it was, it was, of course, bad, but it was also, let's admit it, you know, there was an advantage in the sense that you were often the only one. So, mm. you know, you got picked up because, oh, God, we have to have a woman. It was, uh, you know, every now and then it wasn't, uh, mm. of course, they were not as uh, conscious of that as they were, uh, mm. as they are now. But every now and then you were more likely to get picked up for something because you're a woman. In other words, it mm. gave you, a, in some senses, an advantage. In mm -hmm. other ways, of course, the problem is that then when you did present, most of the time people would, you know, be nice about your sari or they would be more, you know, looking at you as a piece of exotica that was there for mm -hmm. um, different kind of consumption rather than just mm -hmm. the ideas you had. Mm -hmm. And so it took a long time to break out of that. I think it really happened only when, you, when I was much older, really, mm -hmm. because I think for a large part of your youth, you get treated in that way, at least I was. And I'm, I'm wondering how different it's been for your generation. Has it been different? Um, I think so. I think there are very many more of us than, than I guess that, that you had or that when I talked to other senior scholars that they had. So it's been great to have a community. I mean, one of the things I still kind of don't like is that most feminist economics economists still tend to be women. I mean, you go to an IAFI conference and you'll find maybe one or two stray, uh, you know, uh, men there who, who, uh, you know, and, and I mean, it's great and we need more allies, but I wish that, that there were more men studying feminist economics and, you know, and by feminist economics, I mean, generally, you know, uh, social inclusion in, in general along, along multiple dimensions. So in some ways, um, it's better because we have this sisterhood of feminist economists. You're not the only one who's studying it. You're not the only one who who understands it. Um, so, so that's that's definitely been different. I mean, my cohort in my PhD had a great fair number of of, of uh, women uh, during my master's. I had a lot of uh, you know cl classmates who were women, and I went to an all girls college, so it was all just uh, <laughs> women. Uh, so that way, I think, yeah, for sure, it has been uh, different. And I also, at least, I don't feel that there is, uh, you know, a sense of uh, what you said about people commenting on your clothes and your appearances more than than your substance. I'm sure there is still a lot of patronizing, probably much more among, uh, you know, sort of quote unquote traditional economics, especially when you're a someone who thinks differently within the traditional economics uh, uh, field. Uh, but but I don't I don't I thankfully don't feel it more as much and and I, I i hope it's my hope that you know going forward it, it that that becomes even less and less and that feminist economics thinking is taken more seriously you are muted jetty i can see that there are some questions coming up in the chat i'm just wondering whether there's a, yeah we'll but, we'll get to those i have i guess yeah. a closing question uh, and then we can kind of get to the yeah. uh, get to, because yeah. we have more yeah. than 100 participants i just want to say that this was the most registered uh, and well at most well attended feminist economic <laughs> session <laughs> that i think jaiti speaks to your uh, your star power if i may um 
so maybe what advice do you have for young scholars, especially who those who are trying to work in macro and trade? You know, what should they study? What should they think about? What should they be reading? What should their research be focused on for those of, uh, who are who are sort of just starting on their journeys into research and PhD? Yeah. You know, this is so uh, such a difficult question. Let me be honest. I think it's difficult. Why? Because I think the things that uh, benefit you professionally are not necessarily the things I'm going to suggest. Mm -hmm. So there is a choice. And I think we have to recognize that, sadly, that's the case, that the mainstream profession is full of gatekeepers, and it makes things pretty tough for people who, uh, you know, don't want to be necessarily very you know a lot falling into those rigid traps so I'm recognizing that and I have full sympathy for people who say well what the hell you know I do need to get into a proper tenure track job and I pro need to become a professor I, I have full sympathy uh, I do also want to say though that I think what I really appreciate I mean I find it so often among so many young scholars you you women have so much guts and you god you need it nowadays so it's good you have it some of us have been very lucky, right? We, we slid through the cracks and we made it in despite all of those things. And a huge amount of this was luck. There's no question about it, right? Because there are so many brilliant women who did not get the same opportunities or didn't, you know, weren't as lucky in different ways. But honestly, you know, it, there are things you will have to do, but don't stop doing the other things that you do think are important and are valuable. So, yes, you may have to do, God forbid, you know, probably have to do some RCTs and stuff as well. You have to, right? But don't not, don't do, not do the research you think is important. Don't stop asking the questions that really matter. Don't mm -hmm. get fobbed off by a lot of the requirements of the mainstream. In other words, what I'm suggesting is maybe, yeah, work a bit overtime just to make sure you keep doing the stuff that really matters, because I do think there are so many burning questions out there that many of you are able to tackle and you have now the skills, you have the, you know, you're, you're very profound. So my advice would be that, listen, we, we know that there is very important work, research and teaching that needs to be done that you must do. And if you have to do other stuff along that to be professionally recognized, go ahead and do that. But don't stop doing this. That, that would be my advice. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jayati. That's useful advice. And I think something that even probably I need to hear from time to time when <laughs> you feel a bit disheartened by the work that you do, that there is scope to do work that is still interesting to you. Yeah. And also to recognize that there's an audience out there that wants to hear this kind of work, that needs to hear this, this work. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's hugely important. So I think oh, we're and, already and, oh, and one more one Sorry. more thing, one more request no. to all of you yes. young people out there, all of you young women out there, please, please, please write as much as you can, wherever you can, in whichever place you can, please put it out there. Keep disseminating. You know, it's yes. really important in any language you can. Please, please, please just keep spreading the word. Yeah, absolutely. I echo what Jayati says, like sometimes we all sort of wait for that elusive top ranked journal or the journal that's going to be read by a lot of people. Sometimes it's really important to just get your word out there and, and you know, grow organically. Um, so I think we now can open for Q&A. There are a couple of questions in the chat, uh, but I want to invite you to kind of maybe uh, take turns, unmute yourself to ask questions. Uh, Yaski, how do you want to do this? Do you want people to raise their hands and recall on them one by one? Okay, uh, maybe we start with someone who had asked a question in the chat already. So Anjali Chauhan, do you want to uh, maybe animate yourself and ask a question? Hello, everyone. Hi, Anjali. Hello, ma'am. I'm greatly delighted, firstly, mm -hmm. from the talk. And thank you so much, everyone, for preparing this safe space to discuss such topics. I mean, uh, I'm in the first year of my PhD. And believe me, this was so heartening to hear such things. I mean, I, I was so confused for one year. Uh, I'm working on the intersections of politics and economics. and the journey has been very overwhelming since now. So starting with my question. <clears throat> so my, uh, can I take the liberty to discuss a bit of my research here? 
I mean, if you can be really brief, yes, because there are already a couple of people who want to ask questions, but sure. Yeah. So to be very brief, the topic of my research is locating autonomy within the neoliberal discourse of women empowerment. So to be very brief as neoliberalism, uh, as we all must be knowing. So uh, neoliberalism has been passing out that empowerment is something uh, which can be earned through earning a wage. So through con contractual work and, and there is a lot of work which ma'am has already done over that informal labor, through informal labor, contractualization <clears throat> and home-based economy. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my throat is not <clears throat> well. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of desourcing and contractualization of work and, and especially, I mean, my focus is on garment industries. So with state already receding and market um, taking over the lives of especially the women, I mean, a part of the care work now, their labor in this sort is also being <clears throat> appropriated. And this whole setup is being called the woman empowerment. So uh, I am trying to locate the autonomy part of this whole setup. And my hypothesis will remain that autonomy is something which resides outside of this uh, the women empowerment aspect of neoliberalism. So I am bringing the negative aspects of it. And uh, the conclusion, I mean, this is my working hypothesis that empowerment will be something which comes out of the creative labor of women. So I just wanted to hear what ma'am thinks about it and uh, if she could guide me a bit and provide me her email so that I can discuss uh, my uh, research idea or something to her whenever she has some time. Anjali, I would be very happy to discuss it with you separately sometime, so do get in touch. But you know, I, I personally think empowerment is such a complex thing. It's, you know, Naila Kabir has done work on this as well, that yes, it, it's yeah. horrible conditions, it's bad, etc. but it still empowers within a household because of the way society is constructed. Unfortunately, they value money, they value you know, and even the sometimes just getting out of the house is a source of empowerment. It's mobility is, a, you know, so it's very complicated. I won't say it's always good. Definitely not. And whenever we're looking at women's employment, we have to be looking at the conditions, the wages and, you know, uh, that occur, the uh, whether or not there's any availability for taking over some of the domestic tasks, which the women still have to perform and all of that. We have to look at all of that. But you know, to say that it would only come from creative labor, that's because it's not, it's not binary. It's not, you know, you're disempowered or you're empowered. It's a very complicated sort of trajectory. And you can be at different parts of that trajectory. And certain things can make a difference even when they have downsides. You know, even, I mean, garment workers in Bangladesh, it's been seen. Yes, it's terrible conditions. I mean, come on, Rana Plaza, you know. Uh, but ask those women it's not only the money it is the fact that that money gives them a different agency in some ways you know so it's it's very complex i i don't know if we can make it very rigid that it would only happen through this way or that but i do take your point completely that the standard neoliberal response which is you know the davos world economic forum thing that oh we should get women in because we're losing so much GDP by not having women in the workforce. And, and that's the only means to empowerment. That's no, no, no good either. I, I completely take that point. Yeah, it's just like they're tapping their labor so that the, uh, the labor can be used to boost their, their growth and yeah. their development. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am, just you can, if you can please yeah. drop your email in the comments, it would be really helpful. I'll put it in, yes, I do that. Thank you so much. Uh, Jayanti, Jayanti, you had your hand up. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you so much. And thank you, first of all, Jayanti. That was a really fantastic lecture. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes. Really? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm based in Sri Lanka. I'm from Sri Lanka, living in Colombo and working here. 
and um, I'm also a feminist activist for the past 18 years. Uh, I'm a little bit old, <laughs> but um, I think my question, I want to pick up on something that, on a statement that you and many others signed recently. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the question is also looking at debt cancellation. I think yeah. you had mentioned this. And as a feminist activist, I would really like to know what is it that we can do to push that? Because there are countries in South Asia, not only Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, Nepal, um, and Sri Lanka, amongst many others. And as you had rightly mentioned in that statement, one of the biggest problems is also the sovereign debt by uh, international sovereign bonds, right? And, and you know, so the high interest rates and all of that. So how, what is it at the, so the first question is, um, because I'm also part of a feminist collective for economic justice. We came together last year when the crisis hit Sri Lanka early, early last year, trying to understand what's going on, how it is impacting women and what can we do really to, you know, bring in that perspective and everything you mentioned today. Um, but I'm also particularly keen to know a little bit more about that cancellation, what can we do as activists, but also the high level panel you mentioned, or are there others that we can advocate with and push for this and what should we do? And yeah. thirdly, any resources you can point me to where this has happened. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, Thank you. absolutely, Jayanti. In fact, again, please, you know, I put my email in the chat, please get in touch and I'll be, we recently just had a discussion with Himal South Asia, with Pakistan, yes. Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, people and you know we were yes. we were discussing I was on that yes. precisely <laughs> this issue okay so you know one of the things which uh, came up very clearly from what ahilan was saying in that discussion you know these private bondholders they have already been paid in full and yes. more because they mm -hmm. are were charging such high interest rates that they mm -hmm. have received their principal and more than the principal already yet they still want to be you know i mean it's literally extracting a, an extra pound of flesh not even the same pound of flesh mm -hmm. an extra pound of flesh is to be extracted this actually has and governments respond why because governments don't really look at the interests of the people until they're forced to and I, the sri lankan government i mean let's face it it's basically the raja Paksha government in disguise right uh you have to force them it's not going to happen on its own and you have to say, look, debt cancellation is happening all the time in private credit markets. In the United States, in London, in India, large corporates are getting debt canceled on a daily basis. Like in India, you know, huge amounts of private debt, corporate debt gets canceled every year, very quietly, not mentioned in the newspapers. When, a farm, when farmers debt get canceled, it's all over the front pages and everybody's saying, oh, how terrible. When it's government debt, they say, no, no, no way we can cancel that. We can postpone the payment, but you have to pay. You have to pay the whole. This is nonsense. All credit markets allow for restructuring. That's the way credit markets work. So, you know, the notion that it's only in sovereign debt that you have to pay the full amount is absolutely ridiculous, number one. Number two is that, in fact, many of these bondholders, as I said, charge much, much higher rates of interest because it's risky because Sri Lanka debt is not safe like US debt, apparently, right? So they took a higher margin of interest and that's why they've already been repaid in full in terms of the interest payments, right? You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm gonna charge you a higher interest rate because you're risky. And then when the risk happens, you say, no, 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 I won't accept any risk. You have to pay me the entire amount. That doesn't work, okay? That's illogical. So that point has to be driven home. Third point, sovereign debt. We say, oh, no, never happened. It's always. Germany in 1951 got a debt cancellation in which half of its debt was written off, half, fully half written off. The rest of it was converted into very easy credit or grants so that they could repay only the principal and they could repay the rest of it over a very long time. And one of the conditions of that debt restructuring was that debt repayment will never exceed 3% of export revenue. 3% of export revenues. Imagine if Sri Lanka got a deal like that, you wouldn't have a debt problem, right? Why can't Sri Lanka get a debt like that, a deal like that? Because that was done when, you know, Germ West Germany versus East Germany, the rich countries were all trying to make sure Germany was all right. But because of that, Germany could grow out of its debt. It could resolve its debt problems within half a decade and become an industrial powerhouse. Basically, 
countries are not willing to give debtor countries today that opportunity. It's not that it can't be done. It's a choice that it's not being done. Now, how do we force a change? We, we make so much noise that it becomes impossible to ignore. It's really that. It's all of you have to bring these arguments continuously to the Sri Lankan public so that they can't get away with it. I mean, you have already shown that you can, you can achieve a peaceful you know, handover of power. Now you have to show that you're not going to accept the same nonsense being done by the new people. So thank you very much, Jati. Very, very helpful. And I will email you to get more resources Certainly. around that. Yeah. Thanks sure. so much. So we have time for maybe one or two questions, Jati. I'll and I'll read them out there already there in the chat. Um, uh, Paramita asks, mainstream cannot explain unpaid care work. So how do we go about it? Um, and the second question is from Leah. And she says that, what are your views on the global North's feminist foreign policies? Do you find them to be performative, neo-colonial, or actual drivers of change? Wow, <laughs> such huge questions. So, you know, yes, mainstream economics cannot explain fair, uh, care work. Therefore, we dump mainstream economics. I really do think that if I'm trying to understand the economy, I have to use the building blocks that help me to understand it, which means that you have to look at human motivation going beyond the standard, you know, utility maximizing framework that looks at work versus leisure and recognize other drivers of human motivation. But you also have to recognize that it's not always that women are doing things because they derive pleasure for it. In other words, you have to recognize relational inequality and power imbalance. And therefore you have to look at power as a driving force in economic processes. There is a lot of unpaid labor because men have the power to make women do that unpaid labor. And sometimes it's even internalized. Sometimes we say, well, it's our job. It's, we are the ones responsible and so on. And of course, Nancy Folbray, my colleague at UMass Amherst has this brilliant thing that, you know, the, the big problem is that you care about those whom you care for. So you're doing this unpaid work, but you care about those people. You're not going to stop doing it because you know the state doesn't provide. You're not going to say, my elderly mother, I'm just going to leave her on the street. Or my lactating child, I mean, my child who needs uh, breast milk, I'm not going to give it because you know I'm not paid for it. It will be delivered. That means you lose bargaining power. When you lose bargaining power, society and those in power exploit that, okay? What we have to do is to recognize that therefore we can only achieve what we have, what we need with solidarity, with working together, with demanding of states as equals, not as you know, begging, oh please, you know, please give us this break. So we have to mobilize, we have to associate with one another, we have to work in coalitions with other groups. In Sri Lanka, it's so evident. Women have to work with the with the fisher work, with the workers, with the farm workers, with everything. And um, essentially, I think we have to change the way in which we conceptualize the economy, which is a big job. It's not in simple. I have given you just a few pointers. Now it's all of you young feminist economists who have to go out there and develop this framework. But we know the other one doesn't work. So we don't have to just keep saying, oh, well, we have nothing else. We have to keep using this framework. No, we have to actually develop a framework that allows us to understand the economy, micro and macro. Yeah. Um, I think there was one question on, um, well, of course, this is about time use data, but yeah. I, there was one on Davos, which I think yeah. in a way yes. deserves I can repeat answer, that. Yes. Says, Go ahead. Uh, do you think that the Davos meeting reproduced in some ways the non-feminist view in the sense that economic decisions do not give real importance to the issues of inequality? You know, this is a fascinating question and I'm going to sound a slightly conspiracy theorist here I don't mean to but what I'm what I do believe is that you know Davos man is not unintelligent they're smart as hell they know that inequality is pervasive and huge they know that it can become a problem to come and bite them but they also know that they benefit from it including gender inequalities so everything they do and suggest is designed to temper inequalities in a way that would still enable the continued exploitation by the very rich, the very powerful, and the very large capitalists. In other words, the Davos principle is, yes, it's anti-feminist, just like it's anti-socialist, it's anti-equality, but it, it is doing that in the terms 
of, in, in other words, it's co-opting a lot of our terms so that it can pretend that it's providing some of these things to us. So in a way, it's almost more dangerous than when they come clean you know, and say, yeah, we're out to get all of you kind of thing. It's, it's more dangerous because it's pretending to actually be, uh, you know, it's like capitalism is an octopus incorporating everything. Davos man is an octopus trying to incorporate and take over and thereby control all of the other attempts of women, of workers, of people around the world to ensure their basic social and economic rights. Excellent. So we are beyond time now, but I just want to thank Jetty for taking our time from what I know was a busy time of the year for you uh, for talking to us. And thank you to the over 100 people who joined this conversation. Uh, I just want to remind you all to sign up for IRP and the IRP Young Scholars mailing list so that you can be uh, notified when we have more events like this. Uh, and once again, thank you so much, Jetty, for, for sharing your valuable thoughts. Well, well, thank you for having me and you know, really go out and get them, ladies. Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, All yeah. right. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you so bye. much. Bye. bye.